Welcome to Electra Online. Now here's another very interesting request of a viewer. The problem seems almost impossible to solve, but then it actually can be solved. So let's read it together and then maybe you want to pause the video and try to do this one yourself. And if you give up, just watch it and see how it's actually done. But here's the way it goes. An object is pushed up a 30 degree incline at an initial velocity of V sub naught. When it arrives back at the bottom, after having reached the distance d of the incline, it has a velocity v sub naught divided by 1.2. What is the coefficient of friction on the incline? So here, pictorially, you can see what's happening. Here's a 30 degree incline. We're pushing an object up with some initial velocity v sub naught. It reaches a distance d of the incline, a height h, vertically, stops at this point, then slides back down the incline, and when it gets to the bottom, it now has a velocity, v sub naught divided by 1.2, and we're trying to find the coefficient of friction. So this, this does clearly appear to be a conservation of energy type of problem, but give it a try and see if you can figure it out. Well, if you give up, take a look at this. So we're going to set up the energy conservation equation, which means that the energy initial equals the energy final. And so we're going to take the energy initial at this point and the energy final at this point. And let's see what happens. So what is the initial energy? Well, it doesn't have any potential energy because the height is zero, but it does have initial kinetic energy. So we can say that it's one half mv initial squared. Now that equals the energy at the very bottom. Again, there's no potential energy, but there's kinetic energy, so that would be one half m now the final velocity squared is going to be, well, I'll just write it up as final velocity squared. Of course, since this is less than this, this is not equal to one another. We need to have something else on the right side to make the equation equal. And of course, that is equal to the energy lost, so plus the energy lost. And how do we lose energy? Well, we have to overcome friction on the way up and friction on the way down. So how do we calculate the energy loss due to friction? Well, for that, and I'm looking for my pen here with different color, we need to figure out the friction force. So here we can see that we have mg, the weight due to gravity, we have the perpendicular component, and we have the uh, parallel component. This is mg sine theta, and this would be mg cosine theta. Now we have a normal force pushing back in the opposite direction, Here's the normal force, and the normal force will also be equal to mg cosine theta. And then we have the friction force. Now the friction force on the way up will oppose the motion, so the friction force will be in this direction. So this is the force friction, which will slow the object down as well as it gaining height. It also has to overcome friction. And so the, the, the uh, force due to friction is equal to the normal force times mu, and the normal force is mg cosine theta, and then times mu, like that. So that's the friction force. Now the energy lost will be the work done to overcome friction, and of course work is equal to force times distance, so in this case that will be the friction force times distance, or the work done, or in other words the energy lost, in one direction is going to be mg cosine theta times mu, like this, that's the friction force times the distance. And of course, the total energy loss will be twice that because not only do we lose energy going up the incline, we lose energy going down the incline the opposite direction. And it's going to be again, the friction force times the distance. In that case, on the way down, the friction force will be acting in the opposite direction. So force friction, but it'll be the same force friction. It's still going to be mg cosine theta times mu. All right, now we can plug in what we have here. So here we write one half mv initial squared is equal to one half mv final squared, which is v initial squared divided by 1.2 squared, plus the energy lost will be two times and I'll write it like that, the energy loss going up and then the energy loss going down, so mg cosine theta times 
times mu times d. So that's the energy loss going up, and then we have the energy loss going down, so we need two of those. Okay, what do we do next? Well, let's get rid of the one-halves and multiply everything by two. We can multiply this out. And also notice that every term contains an m, so we can get rid of all the m's. And we're going to multiply everything by two. So that gives us v initial squared equals v initial squared divided by 1.44, like this. And then multiply that times two, that would be plus four times g cosine theta times mu times d. Now remember that we know what theta is. So this is a known quantity. G is a known quantity. But we don't know V initial. We don't know mu. We don't know D. Wow. And we're supposed to find mu. So at this point, we're beginning to panic. You go, whoa, is this even possible? But then we might remember that we could also do the equation again, but start this as E initial and use that as E final, and maybe get some additional information out of that. So we can also consider this to be E final for our second equation. All right, let's try that and see what happens. We're going to call this E initial, call this E final, because we know at that point the velocity will be zero. Okay, let's try that. So for our second equation, we'll try it E initial equals E final, in that case, what we can say is that our E initial is going to be the same, 1 half mv sub naught squared, 1 half mv sub naught squared equals, now at this point there's no kinetic energy, but there's potential energy. So we can say mgh, and we also will have plus energy lost. Now in this case, the energy lost will only be in one direction, so it'll only be half of this, one of those. And mgh. Now we need to find a value for h. Now we can see that h is the opposite side to the angle. So we can see that, that and let me use a different color, so we can see the difference. So we can say that h equals d times the sine of theta. Now the sine of theta, that's 30 degrees. So h equals d times the sine of 30 degrees. And of course the sine of 30 is 1 half, which means, hmm, let's put it over here, that h is equal to one-half d. All right, so instead of writing h, we could write one-half d and energy loss. So now let's rewrite that equation. So we have one-half mv sub naught squared equals mg times one-half d. And energy loss will be one of those, so it'll be mg cosine theta d times mu, or mu times d, I should put the mu first. Mu times d, put that in parentheses, put a line there so we don't get confused. And now let's simplify that equation. Again, we have an m everywhere, so the m's cancel out. Let's see here. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's multiply everything by 2. So we get v initial squared equals this type 2 gives me g times d plus g. Oh, now we have two of those. Can't forget. Multiply times 2. So now there's two of those. So 2 times uh, g cosine of 30 degrees times mu times d. So what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to look at the two equations to see if I can eliminate something. And notice what I can do now is I can replace this d with what d is equal to out of this equation, and then maybe I can also eliminate v sub naught. So that's the hope, that's the goal. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to solve this equation for d, and then substitute that in here to get rid of the d, and then maybe we can also get rid of v sub naught. So let's try that. Um, I need to factor out a d, factor out a g. So I could say that v sub naught squared is equal to, uh, factor out a g and a d. So I get g times d 
times what I have left would be 1 plus 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees times mu. So 2 times the cosine of 30 degrees times mu. Because I factor out a g and I factor out a d, so I get a 1. A g and a d, I get 2 cosine 30 times mu. All right, now I could solve that for d. Now I could say that d is equal to v sub naught squared divided by g times 1 plus 2. Well, you know what? I'm going to calculate what that cosine of 30, and I'm looking for my calculator. Haha, <laughs> there it is. Okay, 30, take the cosine of that, times 2, 1.732. Well, I should have known that without having to use a calculator, but hey. So, 1.732 mu. And now, I can take this here and substitute that into my equation over here. Okay, let's do that, Let's see what we get. So now we have v initial squared equals v initial squared divided by 1.44 plus 4g times the cosine of theta times mu times. And instead of d, we're going to write this. So v initial squared divided by g multiplied times 1 plus 1 plus 1.732 mu. <laughs> Remember, we're solving for mu. We can't lose the fact that we're trying to solve for that. But notice, we can do some simplification. Here we have a g in the denominator and g in the numerator. So that cancels out. K. Now notice, every term contains a v sub naught squared. So I can get rid of this v sub naught squared, that v sub naught squared, and this v sub naught squared. That turns into a 1, that turns into a 1, and that turns into a 1. Wow. Now I have things in a much simpler fashion, because here I have 1 over 1.44. I have a 1 over here, so I can move this to the left side. It'll be a single constant. And then notice here, I can probably, ah, I can then multiply this through, separate the mu sub naughts and solve for mu sub naught. Okay, you may not have followed what I was trying to do here, but I'm kind of thinking ahead. So what I can do is the following. Uh, first of all, 1 divided by 1.44. Let's do that. So 1 divided by 1.44. So now, on the left side, we end up with, so now I'm going to go from here to here, end up with 1 minus... <coughs> because I moved this term now to the left side, and 1 divided by 1.44 is 0 0.6944. I add an extra couple of decimal places, not significant, just so I don't make an error. So equals, now, we have 4 times the cosine of theta. Well, 2 times the cosine, that's 30, remember, that's 30 degrees, right? We could replace theta by 30 degrees. The cosine of that is 0.866 times 4. So let's do that. So we have 30, take the cosine, times 4. So we get 3.464. So on this side, we get 3.464 instead of 4 times the cosine of 30 times mu. And then we end up with here, we end up with 1 divided by 1 plus 1.732 times mu. Okay, so now we have a, an algebraic problem with only mu in there. We can solve that algebraically from mu. So first we have to combine these two and then multiply. So here we end up with 1 minus 0.699, oop, 1 minus 0.6944. So we end up with 0 0.3056, 3056 multiplied times this quantity right here, which is 1 plus 1.732 mu is equal to, let's go like that, is equal to 3.464 mu. So now I have to multiply this times this and move it to the right side. On the left side, we end up with this times this. On the left side, we end up with 0 0.3056 is equal to, multiply this times this, and subtract it from that. So 3.464 mu minus this 
times this times mu, so 0 0.3056 times 1.732 is minus 0 0.5293, 5293 mu. Again, I use an extra several decimal places just so I don't, uh, don't have an error, a rounding error. So then moving up here to complete this, so we have 0 0.3056 is equal to 3.46464 um, minus 0 0.5293, 5293 equals, so now I end up with 2.9347, mu. And so therefore mu is equal to, divide this by that, oh, something is drastically wrong. I certainly did. Oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. No, no panic, I, things are good. <laughs> All right, it's this divided by that, right? See what happens when you skip a step and you get lazy? Ah, that's what happens. So it's this divided by that, so 0 0.3056 divided by 2.9347, so mu is equal to, okay, take the inverse of that, uh, times point. 3056 equals, and I get mu is equal to 0 0.104. And there we have it. Now, if I made a mistake somewhere, I might be off, but that seems like a reasonable result. And uh, there it is. That is the coefficient of friction on the incline if we push an object up with initial velocity v sub naught, and it comes back down with a final velocity of v sub naught divided by 1.2. And uh, that is how it's done. Would it work if you use the other side to get, find, um, find D? The other, when the initial velocity on top of the slope is B is equal to zero, B is not equal to zero? Initial velocity? Yes, you can use, you can use this to find out the D, uh, considering same thing, zero of initial velocity, final velocity is this, and yes, we should be able to get this very same result. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to do it if you just used the two separately instead of um, using, you know what I mean? So let, let's take that point. Um, you still need to have two separate equations, yes. right, to get rid of that. Now let's say, what did I do? I used this. I went on the way up. So I had initial velocity, initial kinetic energy, final potential energy, energy lost. The equation, if we use the second drawing, would look exactly the same. Because what would happen is you would have initial energy would be potential energy, final energy would be kinetic energy, and then the energy loss plus energy loss. So you have the, the very same. No, no, I mean, the whole problem, what if you don't do it the first step where you use initial velocity is at the bottom and the final velocity is at the bottom? Um, so what you're saying is you solve it going up and then you solve it going down and combine those two. Matter of fact, I think we should try that. <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. And then we can check the answers because I don't know what the correct answer is. All right. So let's try that. That's actually a really good idea.